In March of 1983, residents living next to this storage area at the Alabo Street Wharf in New Orleans' Lower Ninth Ward made a strange discovery. One half million pounds of radioactive uranium was being stored a few feet from their homes. When they discovered where the uranium had come from, community concern grew. This was South African uranium, shipped across the ocean from a country where black miners labored under a white minority government, living as virtual slaves in their own homeland. Several community organizations have suggested a ban of products coming through the port of New Orleans from racist countries like South Africa. How do you feel about products coming from South Africa, and in particular uranium, which is being used to build nuclear weapons coming through the port here? I think it stinks. Well, really, I don't think we should do business with South Africa, period. Well, I feel any place that uh, majority could be ruled by minority, I say more power to the minority. Okay, how do you feel about products that are coming from South Africa, you know? I have no objection to buying anything from South Africa. How would you feel about banning uh, uranium coming from South Africa? I think it should be banned. And then the uranium coming into this port, it'll make us a target for all the nations that's against it. So they automatically would make that against the port of New Orleans. Um, how would you feel about a ban on products from South Africa because of the segregationist policies of the apartheid regime in South Africa? I'm not sure that a ban on products coming into the United States would make much of a difference to the regime that is going on there now, seeing as the white elitists will continue to do the things that they are doing. But, uh, you know, it is a disgusting situation, and a form of pro as a form of protest, it might be an effective uh, thing to do, really, you know, I mean, just as a form of protest, I really don't think that it'll, you know, create any economic hardships that will uh, change their policies, but, uh, you know, just to realize that there are people in the world that think that things should be changed over there, I think is important. Varied as people's opinions on a boycott might be, almost all agree that apartheid, the system of racial oppression in South Africa, is a matter of concern for the whole world. Making up only 17% of the population, the white minority government of South Africa rules millions of blacks in the only nation in the world which makes white skin a requirement for political rights. President Reagan argues that conditions are improving for South African blacks. But Selby Samela, a political refugee from South Africa, takes a different view. There is no political freedom in South Africa. Anyone who doesn't know that, you know, doesn't want to face reality. There is none. Actually, I, my involvement in this kind of started when I was, what, 14 years old. That was in uh, about 19, 1970. 1974, when I got arrested, you know, for not having a passbook. Um, like I said, I was 14, 14 years old, and uh, that, you know, that uh, that arrest sort of changed the whole picture around from there onwards. I think that's what led, you know, or drew me to be more active in the student movement after, because before then, you know, I couldn't directly, you know, relate to what uh, these other student organizers were talking about. You know, I was well, like, one of the youngest kids, you know, at the school, and uh, I really, you know, didn't know too much except what I was, you know, being told. But, you know, like I said, the arrest, when I got arrested, you know, in 1974, for not having a passbook, you know, and, you know, I spent, you know, three months in jail. I'm talking about the 14 year old boys, you know, being locked up illegally in jail, you know, with hardcore criminals for three months. You know, that was, you know, the beginning. Samela recalls an incident that occurred between South African police and the mother of a fellow black student leader. One of Tiet uh, Machinene, who was uh, the president of the student movement, was one of the guys, you know, who was. Uh, been looked up you know, for. One day, the you know, the the SAP, the South African Police, went to his uh, mother's house, and uh, went and delivered the coffin 
and forced and forced this coffin, you know, to his mother, and they told Titi's mother to uh, take that coffin and put it under Titi's bed, because next time they'll bring the body. Many commentators liken apartheid to the segregationist Jim Crow laws of the South, but activist Craig Shelton says there are some important differences. It's more extreme than Jim Crow in that Jim Crow used to a lot more money for education for white people than it did for black people, whereas in South Africa, white people don't have to pay for education and it's compulsory. And uh, the black people in South Africa, the indigenous Africans in South Africa, have to pay money for education and they receive a less quality education, even though they do receive education. Also in South Africa, you have a 87% majority that is black indigenous Africans in South Africa that are only al allowed to live in less than 13% of the land, which means that the other 87% of the land is reserved for for 13 percent of the population which is white and so they're living in in, uh, in in conditions where they have little shacks where they used their grandfathers used to live in nice houses they are, are forced to live in little shacks where there's hardly any natural resources in the land where they live and they're told that they have self-government in these lands but actually the south african government has as a puppet the chief of that land and, and the chiefs weren't elected like past chiefs were they were appointed by the south african government colleen mcguire a founding member of the New Orleans Committee Against Apartheid, recalls the experience of working on a black South African's legal defense. I worked for Dennis Brutus on his political asylum campaign, or his hearing, it was a trial. I did the research on the South African laws, um, and I also helped out at court. And so I got to know Dennis and, and the the uh, legal situation in South Africa a lot better. I poured through those books and it, I mean, we all know that that uh, blacks in South Africa must carry a passbook, but to see it in writing that it is actually laws is just, it, it was an extraordinary experience. Despite the cruelty of the apartheid system, each year more imports from South Africa arrive on the docks of New Orleans. In 1983, close to $250 million worth of South African trade passed through the port. Big money is at stake here for some of the city's largest corporations. Housed in this high-rise in O'Keefe is Control Data, one of the top 20 U.S. investors in South Africa. Across the street at Poydras Towers, the IBM Corporation supplies computer equipment to the South African military. One Shell Square Building plays host to American Express, which acts as a travel agent for South Africa. And Merrill Lynch offers apartheid stock bargains for investors looking for high profits from cheap South African labor, labor that guarantees investors almost 50% higher profits than rest of the world. Our own electric company, Nopsy, takes advantage of low apartheid wages by using South African uranium in their nuclear reactor. In fact, uranium accounts for over half of all South African imports through the port. Companies such as Likes Brothers and Saf Marine continue to profit from this deadly radioactive trade. Colleen McGuire comments on her research. I did some research myself. I went down to the Commerce Department at the ITM building, and I discovered just how much uranium comes into this country from South Africa. Prior to 1982, no South African uranium entered the ports of New Orleans. Then in 1982, something like 630 tons came in. By 1983, this had tripled to 1,900 tons that had a value of $81 million. Could you tell us a little something about what the conditions are like in the mines in South Africa where this uranium is mined? <clears throat> the miners uh, have the, the, the poorest conditions. Uh, I mean, work under the poorest conditions you know, uh, among people, those people that work uh, in various you know, industries in South Africa and they, uh, they get their lowest pay, and they work normally the longest hours. Uh, according to the latest figures that I saw some three months ago, uh, workers, uh, mine workers in South Africa make something like uh, $36 a week. 
Once the uranium leaves the port, it begins a controversial journey by rail, ending up in potentially hazardous nuclear power plants and nuclear weapons. The process by which uranium ore is enriched for commercial use in power plants and bombs is expensive and complicated. Activist Gary Gresh explains. Well, the enrichment process that the United States offers uh, to foreign countries basically takes uranium ore shipped into this country, we enrich it, which means that we make the fissile material, the uranium-235, more concentrated within a particular type of, of rock that is used to make the fuel rods. We do that at a cost for the electric utilities in this country and also as a subsidy to foreign countries who are mining uranium. Uh, it is another way in which taxpayers uh, really subsidize the, the nuclear industry. But it's especially abhorrent in situations like South Africa in which uh, the uranium is being mined from in, an, in, in, a, in a country that is so racially divided and so racially troubled that, in fact, the reason uranium from South Africa is slightly cheaper than the uranium in the rest of the world now is simply the same reason the cotton was king in the Old South. It's good and it's easy to make a cheaper product when you've got slave labor. In my opinion, uh, the use of South African uranium by New Orleans uh, would mean that the water dripping from the back of the air conditioners in New Orleans would simply be the blood of black South Africans. It was the United States that provided South Africa's white minority government with the technology to build its own nuclear bomb. We asked Brad Ott of the Campaign for Nuclear Disarmament why his organization is joining the issue. We oppose uh, South African uranium coming through our port because of the many connections it has with the spread of nuclear technology, uh, the continuation of apartheid in South Africa, the oppressive system of racial segregation and oppression, and also uh, the spread of nuclear materials throughout the world and uh, nuclear contamination throughout the world. I think that the United States will have to take steps towards uh, showing good faith that they want to stop the arms race. And one of the ways to do it is to ban shipments of South African uranium in the port of New Orleans and in the U.S. What role can Americans play in ending the apartheid system? President Reagan says that investments in South Africa have a liberalizing effect on the apartheid system. But many South Africans consider these arguments an attempt to disguise narrowly greedy desires. They say that the U.S. corporations prop up the apartheid system. We find that they were, were partners in a crime in South Africa where the people used to be real healthy and strong, some of the healthiest people in the world. Now they're some of the poorest people in the world because these corporations, along with government's armies, went into South Africa and destroyed the natural resource, some of the natural resources of South Africa, or should I say agriculture of South Africa, the trees and the crops, and made the people leave the homes of their fathers and go into uh, small land. In response to Reagan's cooperation with the South African government, organizations around the world are advocating non-cooperation with companies which invest in South Africa. In December of 1984, Oakland dock workers refused to unload a South African ship for several days until forced to by a court order. And recently, a group of clerks in Ireland went on strike when they discovered that their employer was handling South African products. Locally, activists encourage other actions. What do you tell people who are interested in working against the apartheid system here in New Orleans? I think that divestment is a good way. It, it is one of the things. And if, if people's public monies are invested in corporations that do business in South Africa, they should write their, their state representative, their council person, whatever, say, please get my money out of that country, out, out of those corporations that want to bloody and stain their hands. At first, um, I'd say that Americans should know that they have the full support and, you know, uh, and backing of the, of the majority of the people of the Africans in South Africa to do these things. Uh, it is very difficult for South Africans in South Africa to stop IBM, to stop you know, Ford, except what they can do to those plans there in South Africa. 
but out here and people in South Africa don't have freedom of speech you know we cannot demonstrate we cannot pick it um, there is no dialogue you know between us and the government because that government doesn't really present us anyway so in South Africa there's very little that people can do except if people you know resort to violence means uh, out here I um, things are not necessarily you know the same you know there's pressure that can be put on this you know, this on this uh, companies you know because I um, mean it's not like you know people in South Africa asking people to go then fight for them you know they say you know the struggle I mean the people in South Africa will fight on that front on the South African front but people here can you know can fight on this front and we believe like I say you know that you know if Americans can be successful in doing some of these things I mean that that will definitely you know, uh, affect what goes on in South Africa. Now, what we can do as citizens of this country and as persons who live in cities or rural areas where they have coin dealers, they might carry the Cougaran, which is a South African gold coin, which uh, has a heavy impact on supporting the apartheid regime and helping them buy weapons to kill innocent women and children. We can go to these coin stores and ask the owners of the coin stores not to sell this Cougaran because they can get gold coins from America and from Canada. And a lot of times we hear people saying, buy America, buy America. Well, there are gold coins made in America that people can buy. They don't have to buy the gold coins of South Africa. Actions against local representatives of South Africa have had an impact. The local honorary South African consul was located in this magazine street office. After several protests, including this one at his home residence, the South African government closed the office. Of all the companies in New Orleans that do business with South Africa, not a single one was willing to give us an on-camera interview. Employees of South Africa Marine and Krugerrand Corporation even refused to give their names. An air of secrecy enshrouds the New Orleans apartheid connection. The situation in South Africa is worsening daily. Recent violence has caused many to wonder what it will take to bring justice. Is it going to take a revolution to defeat apartheid in South Africa? And if so, is that going to be a violent or a nonviolent revolution? Well, really, I don't know. That's not for me to say. Um, but the thing I mean to uh, to notice is that. And when you talk about the situation in South Africa, we have to recognize that, I mean, first you are talking about uh, uh, a very violent system of government, the apartheid government. Uh, I mean, those, that is a, it is a violent government. They believe in violence. And uh, I mean, we look at these people's history. I mean, they were, they were prisoners during World War II. I mean, these are confirmed criminals. I mean, you look at their history, you know, of uh, what they, of, you, know, you look at their deeds, I mean, they will, they suggest that these are people that believe in violence, and uh, I I don't. They have not done anything to suggest to me to anybody that they are prepared to to sit down and you know uh, solve the the problem uh, by peaceful means. They have not uh, shown the, you know the interest in that. So that I mean leaves us with no alternative. Samela explains why some black South African groups have accepted aid from the Soviet Union, a policy which apartheid supporters are sharply critical of. This, the United States and other Western countries all this time have been uh, collaborating with South Africa, you know, economically, militarily, they've been supplying South Africa with high tech, you know, despite you know, an, an embargo, a UN embargo you know, uh, imposed on that country. So while these countries are giving aid to, to those white oppressors there, they are not giving aid to us. So I mean, since they're not going to give aid to us, we are going to take aid from wherever we get it from. The South African connection touches thousands of people in New Orleans every day through business investments, pension funds, and the port. How we confront these problems and deal with it may be an indication of the depth of our wisdom and compassion. At the base of Canal Street in the heart of downtown New Orleans stands a century-old monument dedicated to racists who died fighting for white supremacy in Louisiana after the Civil War. Only a few miles away stands another statue dedicated to someone who died fighting for racial equality. Two very different visions of society are reflected in these monuments, racism and equality. And our approach to the South African trade 
here in New Orleans will lead back to one monument or the other. If you would like more information on local groups working against apartheid or a free copy of this program, call 366-7009.